pleasure to welcome you to our Dean's Convocation and our speaker today, uh, Professor Ken Schatz of Stanford University. It's a real delight to welcome Ken to Logan and to Utah State University and the Huntsman School of Business. I had the privilege of getting to know Ken a couple years ago when I visited uh, the Dean of the Stanford Business School in concert with a few of our, our faculty colleagues. We were down there uh, looking at the wonderful new campus that uh, Stanford Business School has so that we get some ideas about our own new building that we're, we're building here. And uh, we received a wonderful and warm welcome. Uh, and in the course of those uh, visits, we also asked the dean uh, for the privilege of meeting with some of their best and brightest faculty. And the dean directed us to Ken. And uh, Ken was of particular interest to us because one, as you know, one of our uh, foundation principles, one of the pillars of the school, is ethical leadership. And Ken is studying ethical leadership with a very, very interesting perspective uh, as a political economist. Uh, I found our conversations to be absolutely fascinating. I've subsequently had the opportunity to, to uh, see Ken and run into him at a couple of uh, academic conferences, most recently in New York uh, at a conference uh, sponsored, co-sponsored by the Aspen Institute and the Ford Foundation. Uh, I know you're going to enjoy this conversation today. Ken is uh, 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 not only a graduate of, of uh, Stanford with his PhD, but he has also served as a faculty member at Northwestern, uh, at Michigan. He's been a visiting professor at the uh, Woodrow Wilson School at uh, Princeton. So won't you join me in welcoming Ken Schott. Okay, so thank you, uh, Dean Anderson, for the very warm welcome, and thank you all for coming to this talk. I've had, you know, by everyone I've interacted with uh, during my time in Logan, I must admit it's been a brief time so far. I arrived uh, yesterday evening, but I've found people to be very warm and welcoming, um, and I've really enjoyed the experience so far. I actually want to start off by gathering some data from you guys. So if you have a computer or a smartphone with you, could you go to the following URL? So this is just tinyurl.com forward slash M4WKQVJ, all lowercase. I'm going to use this later in the talk. Then I'll actually say what I'm going to talk about. And there's a survey there that'll take you, you know, a minute to take. You and I are probably the only people in this room who don't have smartphones. He, is anyone able to get it to work? Raise your hand if it's working for you. Okay, so it's working, good. So I guess while you're doing that, I'll, I'll say a little bit about uh, who I am. I'm actually a professor of political economy. It's, it's somewhat ironic that I'm talking about ethics. It's what I teach, is my main teaching job at uh, Stanford University now, even though I don't really have a whole lot of formal training in either sort of philosophy or the psychological type of stuff that I'm going to be talking about uh, today. So I think there's two ways of taking that. One way of taking that is that you just made the mistake of attending a lecture by someone um, who is not an expert on the stuff that they're talking about. And another way of taking it is that you've just come to a lecture by a, a, an academic 
who thinks that some other people's research is so important that he wants to talk about the type of stuff that other people do as researchers rather than the sort of stuff that the, he himself does as researchers, as a researcher. And you know, that's kind of rare in academia. Normally we think you know, our approach to things is really the, the one true way to do stuff. So I, I hope you'll take the latter interpretation um, over the course of this session. Um, let me see how many responses we got so far here. Okay. Okay, so by now most people should have had a chance to fill that out. I'm going to just quickly gather that and calculate some means. Okay, there we go. Here we have our numbers, 58, 58. Okay, so that's all I need. You don't need your laptops or smartphones for anything else. I'll return to the data that I just collected at the end of the, this talk. Uh, the subject of this talk is values-based leadership. Uh, lessons from corporate scandals and from psychology, moral, uh, cognitive, and social psychology. So I'm going to start by talking up about a couple of recent high-profile scandals. Uh, then I'll talk about some of the psychological literature that I think is really important. And then I'll tie that back into uh, sort of the events over the course of these corporate scandals. And I'll ultimately draw some implications for uh, positive values-based leadership. So a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about is fairly negative, you know, bad things that ultimately happen. But when thinking about leadership, I also think it's, imp it's important to think about, you know, the positive opportunities uh, for productive uh, leadership that produces lots of, you know, benefits and good for the world. So I want to start off by talking about the first major post Sarbanes-Oxley accounting fraud scandal. This occurred at a, a health company, which is a Fortune 500 company, known as HealthSouth. This was a very rapidly growing uh, company and you know, doing a variety of different innovative things, actually, um, in sort of designing medical operations and the like, not surgery things, but you know, the, the design of the medical business. And this scandal broke in 2002 to 2003. It turned out that this company had, over the course of about half a decade, overstated their earnings to the tune of about 3 billion US dollars. So this is enormous, enormous, large-scale fraud. You know, stock price crashes, they get delisted from the New York Stock Exchange. Actually, a bunch of executives wound up pleading guilty. Several of them went to prison. The CEO, interestingly, was acquitted on charges associated with this scandal. There was not the sort of smoking gun evidence that showed that he had uh, done something wrong in this case. But he, it turns out he's actually a rather sort of he seems like not the world's best individual, shall we say. He subsequently went to prison for uh, bribing the governor of the state of Alabama. Um, so he wound up being convicted of, of a, a different scandal, actually. Um, this scandal started very small. So those of you, when you've studied accounting, you've probably learned that there's ways that firms could do things like managing their earnings. Um, and before the time of the Enron scandal, there was systematic empirical evidence that firms were managing their earnings using things like voluntary discretionary accruals. In the healthcare industry, things like revenue recognition assumptions, assumptions about of the people who owe our company money, how many of them are going to pay up, that can really affect a firm's bottom line, its earnings estimates, and the like. And so they started out fairly small, doing sort of small changes to their earnings assumptions, and even telling their auditors that they were doing this. Over time, though, the scandal became absolutely enormous. You know, you don't do $3 billion of, of fraud with little tweaks here, right here and there around the edges. This became a really large-scale scandal, uh, sort of making up numbers and just completely lying to their auditors along the way. So why does this happen? 
And you can think of a lot of possible explanations for why you would have accounting fraud occurring. And as someone who comes from sort of a rational choice-based discipline, so I'm a political economy scholar, my initial way of thinking about things is to think about incentives. What were the incentive structures in place that could induce people to behave in an unethical manner? And there were a variety of different types of incentives going on at HealthSouth that were potentially problematic. One of them was that senior leaders had options, so they had incentives to want the stock price to be high. Um, in terms of their relationship with their auditors, internally, it turned out that HealthSouth had been hiring people for internal audit positions who were underqualified for their jobs. Why does that matter? Well, that matters for two reasons. One is it's easier to slip something by someone who's underqualified for their job. But the second reason is that in, in the small town where, you know, fairly small city where Hell South was based, the people who had these jobs knew that if they lost their job, they weren't going to get as good of a replacement job. So they had an incentive potentially to look the other way as this fraud was going on. In terms of their relationships with their external auditors, there were incentive problems as well. So Ernst & Young was the accounting firm that were their external auditors. A lot of this fraud occurred post Sarbanes-Oxley. So this is at a time when there was a rule that companies couldn't simultaneously sell accounting services and consulting services to the same company. Why does that matter in terms of incentives? Because there was a view, and a pretty compelling view, that if you're selling consulting services to a company and also doing financial audits on the company, then you might have an incentive to sort of do those audits in a way that generates whatever numbers the company wants you to come up with so you could keep selling them consulting services and making a lot of money off of the consulting stuff you're selling them. So Ernst & Young wasn't selling consulting services to Health South. But most of the money they were making from Health South was not from financial audits. It was from something else. It was from the, something called pristine audits. And what pristine audits were was that Ernst & Young would send a low-level Ernst & Young employee to visit a Health South facility and see, was it clean? Was it pristine? And that's where they were making the vast majority of their money in their relationship with Health South. Now, when this scandal, when there were hearings before Congress about this scandal, the question arose, is it the case that Ernst & Young had an incentive not to look super carefully at the financial numbers because they were making all this money off of pristine audits? So that's another type of incentive problem here. But incentive problems are everywhere. Lots of companies give options to senior leaders, often because they want to incentivize them to work hard and you know, cause the stock price to be successful. All sorts of companies could hire internal auditors who were underqualified or come up with ways to sort of skirt the Sarbanes-Oxley rules about accounting and consulting. So the fact that their incentive problems is not unique to Health South. So what might explain what was going on there? Well, maybe there's a villain. Maybe there's a bad guy here. When something bad happens, our natural instinct to say is to say something bad and unethical happened. Well, there must be really, really bad and unethical people who are involved with this. And the former CEO, Richard Scrushy, is a pretty good candidate for that. And this is a guy who went to prison for, govern for bribing the governor of the state of Alabama. And while he was in prison, paid people to set up a website talking about how his civil rights were violated. You know, in Alabama, a place where a lot of the U.S. civil rights movement was fought, this poor guy, Richard Scrushy, is unfairly having his civil rights violated for being in prison for bribing the governor. Um, he's kind of a piece of work, actually. So, you know, so maybe he is a bad guy, but there were a lot of other senior executives involved. It wasn't just this one guy. There's over a dozen of them, maybe two dozen of them. And that has to make you think, how did a bunch of bad people all wind up at the same company? That's quite a coincidence. Or maybe there were some of the people who were involved in the fraud who weren't such bad people. Maybe they were normal people. Maybe they were even generally good people. But in a certain circumstance, they wound up doing bad things. OK, that's the first scandal I want to talk about. The second scandal that I want to talk about is the LIBOR scandal. And this is a rate fixing scandal. This actually is a, a bus stop ad for the best fixed rates. Um, that seems too good to be true, you know, that a London bus stop would have an ad from Barclays about rate fixing at a time when there was rate fixing going on. Uh, this is actually a Photoshop job um, that someone did at the time, sort of sent around the internet. So LIBOR is the London Interbank Overnight Rate. What is that? 
the basic idea of the LIBOR is this is the rate at which banks lend to each other unsecured funds. So in the LIBOR is calculated for different durations, one month, three months, one year, and the like. This is an absolute cornerstone of the global financial system. When people have adjustable rate mortgages, when people have adjustable rate student loans, when people do financial derivatives transactions, a huge amount of that, literally trillions of dollars of that, is indexed to the LIBOR rate. It's sort of taken as like this sort of truth out there in how people handle things um, in a lot of finance. Where does the LIBOR rate come from? You know, we don't just know this thing. The way it's calculated, and this is sort of developed over time, originating with the practices of a bunch of British bankers a while ago, is there's a, there's a panel of banks. And the banks submit, uh, at a certain time each day, the rate that they would have to pay for unsecured funds. And then some outliers are tossed out and an average is calculated. And this rate was manipulated. So that means that a foundation of the entire financial system that was affecting millions of people, probably billions of people worldwide, was manipulated by people who were trying to gain from it. What was their incentive to manipulate this rate? Well, basically it comes down to derivatives trades. And I think the easiest way of thinking about it is what's called a swaps trade. Um, so Doug and I might engage in a swaps trade where he tells me that at some point in the future, he will pay on a, a large amount of money, actually, a fixed rate of 5%. And I say that I will pay to Doug a rate that is something like the LIBOR rate at that future time plus 2%. So we sort of set that up so it's sort of ex ante fair between the two of us. But basically, Doug is then making a bet that the LIBOR rate is going to go up. And I'm making a bet that the LIBOR rate is going to go down. And what that means is when that date approaches, when we're going to settle this, Doug wants a high LIBOR and I want a low LIBOR. And what would happen is within a bank like Barclays, you had some people who were doing these derivatives swaps trades, and you had other people whose job it was to submit the rate for, that went into the calculation of the LIBOR that determined the level of profits on those derivatives transactions. So then there's an incentive for people within the bank to be submitting the wrong rate. There were also possibilities for collusion across banks. So say I'm someone at Barclays and I want the LIBOR to come in low at a particular time. I might try to contact people at other banks and get them to submit lower rates to drag the average down as much as possible. So that was actually sort of the first phase of the LIBOR scandal. There was a second phase that I'm not going to talk about here, which was that during the credit crisis of 2007 to 2008, banks were worried about appearing weak. And one way that people might think a bank was weak is if it had to pay really high interest rates on funds. So if a bank has to pay 15%, then you might say, oh, wow, they're in trouble. There might be, they might be the next Lehman, actually. There might be a run on the bank. So banks were systematically understating their LIBORs, uh, their LIBOR submissions in 2007 to 2008. But I'm going to focus on this sort of attempt to help individual derivatives traders, actually. This scandal breaks in 2012. It initially breaks uh, when Barclays admits what they've done, but then it quickly spreads to a whole bunch of other banks, like dozens of banks around the world, really, really major ones. And they wound up paying collectively over $2 billion in fines for this. So that sort of gives you a sense of uh, the magnitude of the scandal and the, the seriousness with which uh, regulators have taken the scandal. Um, this led to the resignation of uh, the CEO of Barclays, Bob Diamond. It's also led to uh, some criminal prosecutions as well. So why did this happen? Well, part of the answer, again, has to do with incentives. When, in the same bank, you have someone who is submitting a rate that determines the profitability of someone else's trade, <laughs> there's an incentive for them to get together and submit the wrong rate. Also, there's incentives for collusion across banks. There's also the fact that there was sort of ineffective compliance offices within a lot of banks. In a lot of companies, the compliance group isn't exactly the most popular people in the world. Um, and in Barclays, it seemed, according to the, the reports on the scandal, that the compliance office wasn't really uh, taken seriously and able to follow up effectively when there were reports of uh, frauds going on. But all that said, and despite the fact that a lot of people were engaging in this sort of fraud, a lot of people weren't. 
There were a lot of derivative traders, probably the vast majority of derivatives traders in the world, who were not trying to manipulate the LIBOR. There were submitters at Bank who had that job of submitting the rates, who didn't lie when they submitted the rates. So then there's the question, well, why does it occur some places and not others? You know, and maybe the answer, as with Health South, maybe the answer has to do with there being villains. So maybe it's because, so Barclays, you know, British bank had um, had a, a new CEO, actually, uh, Bob Diamond, who, he was American. So, you know, he's playing, you know, trying to be really aggressive in the firm culture and things like that. Maybe that's a story about what's going on in the LIBOR scandal. But that's not a very good explanation, actually, in the sense that he was not even remotely involved with most of what was going on with these attempts to manipulate the rates to benefit individual traders. Later, he was involved when there was sort of the systematic understating he was involved with this. But the attempts to help individual traders at the early stages of the scandal, he wasn't directly involved. And the most that one could say is that maybe he promoted a culture in the firm that was problematic and made it easier for these sorts of things to happen. So I'm going to suggest that rather than thinking about incentives, which is the natural thing that I as an economist type person think about, or rather than thinking about villains, we should maybe thinking of, think about something else as an explanation for examples of corporate wrongdoing. And that's actually human psychology. Human psychology of the people who did these bad things, but also human psychology of all of us. And I'm going to actually make a fairly disturbing point that we should be worried about ourselves. We should be worried that maybe we, in their shoes, might have done what they did. So I'm going to talk about some of the key themes and some of the classic research that has been done in a variety of different branches of psychology, in moral psychology, in cognitive psychology, and in social psychology. And the first thing that I want to note as an aside, actually, has to do with the research on moral intuitions. This doesn't really relate directly to these scandals, but I think it's very important that a lot of us you know, have quick gut judgmental instincts about something is morally right or morally wrong. And, but we also have reasons that we use for explaining why something is morally right or morally wrong. And it's sort of disturbing that the moral psychologists have shown that some of the time our gut instincts drive our reasoning on these things. Rather than we, we might like to think of ourselves as sort of rational people, we figure things out and then we decide what is right, true, just, and the like. But it may be that our gut instincts, which are often very culturally determined, are what's driving our reasoning on these things. That's just an aside, though. The main things that I want to talk about are self-serving biases and also social pressures. In terms of self-serving biases, there was a very nice article written in Harvard Business Review by Max Bazerman and a few co-authors. It was called Why Good, Why Good Accountants Do Bad Audits, I believe was the name of the article. What's interesting to me about this article is it was written before the Health South scandal. And these guys described a variety of factors that could lead to auditors not doing the right thing, to accountants not doing the right thing. And when you look to what happened in the Health South scandal, and I actually had the good fortune of being able to interview or set up an interview of the former CFO of Health South after he got out of prison. Um, so I have a, a lengthy video recording of him talking about sort of how this went, what he was doing, and the like. The factors that Bazerman and his co authors said come into play, the, this former CFO, a guy named Aaron Beam, actually spontaneously, sort of without trying, you know, me trying to lead him there, sort of sort of mentioned almost all of them as being factors in what was going on within Health South. Bazerman and his co-authors also uh, produced actually some interesting experimental evidence as part of their uh, article. And this, this experimental evidence had several different components. The first thing that they did was they randomly assigned people roles in sort of a negotiation setting or a lawsuit setting. And so you'd be assigned on one side or on the other side. So one side would think that a, a low value was merited, and the other side would think a high value was merited. And then they were asked to analyze some facts and to say, well, what settlement is the right one? And people's assessment of what settlement would be the right one or what judicial decision would be the right one or what accounting numbers would be the right one were heavily based on the role that they had been randomly assigned. That's interesting. And it's even more interesting that this is true even when they were paid for accuracy. So they were told the closer your estimate comes, 
to the assessment of a neutral party, the more you will be paid for participating in this experiment. And interestingly, they maintain these sorts of self-serving biases, even when being paid for accuracy. And it wasn't just amateurs. It wasn't just you know, business school uh, you know, students at Harvard or something like that. As a Stanford person, I can call them amateurs. I, I guess this is being videoed and posted on the internet, so maybe I shouldn't say that, but so be it. Um, even professional auditors, who this is their career, demonstrated these same sorts of self-serving biases in their assessments. So that should make us worried that maybe in our professional roles, we may be inclined to see things in a way that is, paints ourselves or the positions we want to take in a particularly positive light. So some additional evidence on this actually comes from you guys. So that initial survey I had you guys do is to give an example of what you could call the Lake Wobegon effect. You know, Lake Wobegon, Garrison Keillor's town, where the women are strong, the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. I have asked that set of questions, or actually a slightly bigger set of questions, to a ton of different audiences. I ask it of our MBAs, I ask it of, of it our mid-career executives, I've asked it you know, with participants in senior executive programs, people from a variety of different countries around the world, and everyone shows the same pattern. On average, people think they're better than average. So I asked you, what percentile do you think you fall in? Zero is the lowest, 50 is average, and 100 is the highest in terms of some desirable attributes, athletic ability, quantitative skills, ethical standards, and public speaking skills. And the means that I quickly calculated from your data was that in terms of athletic ability, so just as a note, since this is percentiles, you should have a uniform distribution between 0 and 100 if people are answering sort of accurately. And crucially, the mean answer should be 50. The average of people's self-assessment should be average, 50. In terms of athletic ability, you guys rated yourselves on average at being at the 58th percentile. In terms of quantitative skills, you rated yourselves as being on average at the 66th percentile. In terms of ethical standards, you guys rated yourselves as being on average at the 62nd percentile. And in terms of public speaking skills, you guys rated yourselves on average at being at the 75th percentile. And OK, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this is very scary for me, because then I realize I have all these awesome public speakers in this room. <laughs> and now I, I'm stuck up here, and I'm the only one who's doing the public speaking. Um, so, so, and you guys are completely normal this way. This is not meant, you know, I'm kind of saying this in a teasing tone, but every single audience shows the same pattern. Actually, the one thing that's actually distinctive about you guys relative um, to other groups, which, which may come from a lot of you being uh, members of the LDS church, is that uh, the public speaking skills is particularly high, um, your self-assessments. Normally, people don't put themselves quite so highly ranked in terms of public speaking skills compared to other people. But this general pattern of uh, you know, sort of thinking we're better than average in a variety of positive attributes is very, very common. There's a lot of evidence that we tend to do this. And you might think that's a good thing. I mean, I mean, as an example, when I was uh, in eighth grade, I was only five feet tall. And I used to think, I literally used this phrase, I'm tall for my height, which <laughs> makes no sense whatsoever. Um, but maybe it, makes, it made me feel taller, right? And it, that made me happier. Maybe it makes us happier if we think good things about ourselves. But there's also some troubling implications of this. And this has to do with research that my colleagues Benoit Monin and Dale Miller did on the notion of moral credentialing. So what these guys do is they set up experiments in which people have opportunities, which they basically all take, to do something that makes themselves feel good about themselves, feel good about their ethical standards, think that they're a good person. And what they find is people who sort of have that opportunity to make themselves feel good about themselves, and they all do that, and it's randomly assigned who sort of gets that boost to their feeling about themselves, subsequently feel licensed to do stuff that they feel is unethical. So that should be disturbing, right? If we sort of, when we're feeling good about ourselves, feel we have license to do things that are less ethical, and we're systematically overestimating how good we are compared to other people, maybe we're giving ourselves too much license to do things 
that are out of step with actually our deeply held commitments that we would like to hold ourselves to. So that's a little bit of individual level evidence. Now I want to talk about social psychology for a little bit. And to talk about social psychology, the basic thing I want to say is this guy is a myth. The Lone Ranger, an archetypical Western character, an archetypical American character, um, you know, who's off doing the right thing. And he, this guy is his own independent man. And there's a lot of the time that we like to talk about ourselves as these sorts of rugged individuals who come to our own uh, judgments sort of independent of situations and circumstances around us. And social psychologists have really shown that this is not a particularly accurate description of us, the human beings. There's a lot of different situational factors um, that can drive people's actions and decision making. So I'm going to talk about a couple of classic examples. And the first example was Ash's experiment on conformity. Uh, and so this is done uh, at a time when, well, all experimental subjects back at this time were male. Um, so you go to a room, and there's a bunch of guys around a table, and you're the real participant in this experiment. And you're told, we're going to have an experiment on perception. And the idea is we're going to see which of these three lines is closest in length to this line. And they're sort of held up on cards. And it's really obvious that line C is closest in length. But when people start to go around the room and give their answers, the first person says A, the second guy says A, the third guy says A, the fourth, fifth guy say A, then it comes to the real participant. What do they say? Yeah, 37% of the time they say A. They don't say C. 75% of them conform at least once, it, you know, and their eyes clearly are not faulty enough to, you know, get this wrong. And what's interesting is if one other person says A or says C, then the real participant always says C. And in fact, if one other person says B and breaks with the group, breaks with the conformity of the group, then the real person that the experiment is being done on also says C. So that's sort of you know, powerful evidence of conformity, although albeit in a fairly low stakes situation. I mean, this is like you know, lying about my perceptions of lengths of lines in a psych experiment, I mean, not really high stakes stuff. Um, this next experiment I'm going to talk about is about really high stakes stuff, though. And this is actually an experiment that has to do with authority. There's lots of different types of authority. There's formal authority. There's informal authority, things that come from status, things that come from roles. And this is throughout all firms, because firms, you know, even firms in Silicon Valley, where I come from, where people try to act like they're all egalitarian organizations, that's just not true. You know, firm, firms are hierarchical organizations as well. They may well have egalitarian components, but there's also hierarchies within firms. So it's very important to think about how authority can affect us. And a classic experiment on this was done by Stanley Milgram at Yale University. This is a long time ago. This is back in the day when psychologists could do all sorts of stuff that they can't do now and that, frankly, was really unethical research. And this is a very unethical study, actually. Um, yeah. So, so if you were a participant in this experiment, the way things would have gone, you'd be wandering around campus or wandering around the community in New Haven, Connecticut. And you would see a flyer. and says, we're doing an experiment on learning. Come earn a few bucks by participating in this experiment. So you show up to. Um, to this experiment, and the experimenter, who's a distinguished looking professor in a white lab coat, says, oh yes, uh, so we have two of you showing up for the experiment. We've randomly decided uh, between Jamie and Ken, um, Jamie, you're going to be the, the learner here, and Ken, you're going to be the teacher. Uh, we, de we determined that randomly. Jamie would actually be a grad student who was in on the experiment, and, and the experimenter would say to the person in the, the true subject role, the Ken, my role here, um, what would they say? Oh, this is, a, this is an experiment on learning. And we're going to do this uh, via punishment, actually. We're interested in the role of punishment on learning. And we're interested in a particular type of punishment, electric shocks. Um, and then Jamie would say, oh, that kind of makes me worried because I have a heart problem. And, and the experiment would say, no, 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 that's fine. You know, we know what we're doing here at Yale University. And then they would take Jamie into the other room, and they would uh, strap an electric cuff around her hand. Um, you know, kind of like an electric chair sort of a thing. And then they take me back into the other room where I would sit next to the experimenter. So here's the subject in my role. Here's Jamie with the electric cuff on her hand. Here's the experimenter who's running the show here. And then they, they'd say, I'm supposed to start reading some words to Jamie. And she's supposed to remember them and read them back to me. And she does a pretty good job. But then she messes up one or two. And when she messes up, I'm supposed to give her a shock. 
starts at slight shock, 10 volts, you know, goes up and up and up to 450 volt electric shocks. And in case people don't participate in the experiment, don't understand what volts are, it says things like extreme intensity shock, danger, severe shock, and XXX. <laughs> and if the person in my role starts flipping through those things higher and higher, there's a tape recording in the other room of someone screaming and begging the person in my role to stop, screaming in agony, and then ultimately going silent as the shock levels get higher and higher. So what did people in my role do? What did they do? Did they just administer a few shocks? No, 65% of them went all the way up to 450 volts. Now, they didn't do this happily. It's not like they're going along and flipping things. Ooh, that's cool. You know, she's screaming. Sounds like she's maybe, you know, unconscious or something like that. No, they're, they're not happy about this. They're, they're crying. They're upset. So they'd say, well, we have to stop. This is, this is crazy. This is wrong. And if they said that three times to the experimenter, the experimenter would stop the experiment. That's the conditions under which the experiment was stopped. But 65% of people went all the way up to 450 volts. And if you look at this, 80% of people went up to about 150 volts, which is still a pretty nasty shock to be giving to someone. So what does this mean? You know, one thing that this maybe means is that people used to be more obedient to authority than they are nowadays. Now, we can't rerun this experiment. Thank goodness, right? It'd be not a good idea. That's a pretty bad treatment of the experimental subjects. There's been some cases where people tried to run it with shocks that ended 100 volts, and the pattern looked kind of similar to the initial one. Um, but you can't really get at the full depths of this. So maybe this was just at the time this was done in the 1950s, you know, people were more, con you know, more obedient to authority. Or maybe there's something really bad about people. I mean, but although one, maybe one inference to draw is to say, well, there's that 65% of people, and then there's those people who didn't do much. I bet I would have been in like the 5% that stopped before 100 volts. You know, I, I assume that I probably would have been the good people you know, one of the good people rather than one of the, the people went all the way up to, you know, the 65% who went all the way up to 450 volts. The thing is, though, when they looked at the data, there wasn't really any clear pattern of who went all the way up to 450 volts and who did it. It's, it's hard to know who was actually going to do what. So I think we should have in our mind, maybe if I were in their shoes, the subject's shoes, maybe I would have gone all the way up to 450 volts, no matter how incredibly monstrous that seems. Now, part of this is also the incrementalism of this. You know, once you've given a shock of 180 volts and the distinguished researcher in the lab coat is saying you must continue, going up to 190 volts isn't that big of a next step. So the, the incrementalism of it may have played a role in this actually as well. One other uh, inference that you could draw from this is, wow, humans are just horrible. <laughs> you know, they're immoral, nasty people. And that's a lesson that sometimes people take from this experiment. And I actually think that that conclusion is absolutely wrong as well. And I really think, and I'm going to make this point at the end of the talk, that the big lesson is that social influences on us are profoundly powerful, both for bad and for good. So that's ultimately what I think is the meaning of the Milgram electric shock experiment. OK, so there's some literature from psychology. How does this relate to these scandals, scandals at Hal South? Uh, the LIBOR scandal, other scandals too. If you read the history of Bernie Madoff's deceptions and his fraud, a lot of the same patterns show up there as well. So in the Health South scandal, we see examples of self-serving biases. So Aaron Beam, the former CEO, explicitly says, I just kind of assumed everyone else was doing this. I assumed I wasn't any worse than the other people. The night of their first big cooking of the books, he is an admitted fraudster and former felon who goes around and talks to people about this, says, that night, Bill cooked the books, which is very weird. That's one of his subordinates. He, he's a CFO, and they're doing massive fraud. And he's sort of ex post doing this self-serving interpretation that someone else was cooking the books rather than him being involved cooking the books that night, rather than taking ownership of it, even though he's now admitted that he was a fraudster. The health uh, fraud started very small, as I mentioned earlier, and then got big. It wasn't like they said one day, they said, hey, yeah, let's overstate our earnings by $3 billion. They did it bit by bit, more by more. And as that went on, probably each additional step was easier to do than if they had to do it all at once. 
There are also situational factors. One major situational factor um, that comes into play a lot of the time with corporate scandals, and actually academic cheating as well, um, is time pressure. When people feel like they're in a huge rush, they're much more likely to do things that they wouldn't normally do. And Aaron Beam at the time, you know, ex post says, well, we have to report the quarter. You know, reporting quarterly earnings is a rush to get that done. Um, and he felt under time pressure. Of course, this happened over several years, so you could have taken a step back, but each incremental step occurred under time pressure. There's also substantial authority pressure here. It's hard to know what exactly went on between Richard Scrushy and Aaron Beam, the two of them, the CEO and the CFO at this time. We can't know exactly that interaction. But in, you know, in having Beam interviewed, I got a clear sense that there was an alpha person and there was a person who was not the alpha person, clearly the beta person in the room. Beam was deferential to Scrooge. He was intimidated by him. And he's very impressed by him also as a business person, even though you know, he views Scrooge as being actually a horrible person. So that's another factor that came into play in that scandal. In the LIBOR scandal, we can also see examples of some of these psychological factors. Maybe a lot of the traders and rate submitters assumed that everyone else is rigging the rates. So maybe it's OK if I do it too. There was physical proximity between the rate submitters, at least in some cases, the rate submitters and the traders. In one case at RBS, actually, there was a person who was making trades, high stakes trades, the outcome of which depended on a rate submitted by someone who sat next to them at the adjacent desk. You know, that's not especially good institutional design. There is also a sense of social proximity or chumminess or clubbiness amongst the people doing this. Um, at one point, one of the traders sent an, uh, an email or text to one of the rate submitters saying, I owe you big time, dude. Come over one day after work, and I'm opening a bottle of Bollinger, um, which I guess is like a $50 bottle of champagne or something like that. There were also sort of implicit authority matters going on. So within Barclays at the time of the scandal and within other banks, typically it wasn't the case that the submitter was a subordinate of a trader who had a stake in the outcome of what was submitted. But within the firms, the submitters were lower status than the traders generally. And the way to think of this is the submitters were part of the old line part of the bank, where the bank's doing a lot of business around the world in lots of different currencies. And the submitters are actually the people whose job it is to maintain liquidity for the bank. So it has the money it needs to do whatever it needs to be doing around the world. That's an important and crucial and not very sexy job within banks at this time. The sort of high-flying sexy job is to be a derivatives or a swaps trader. They're the ones who are making millions, doing really risky bets, you know, having to do all sort of complicated analysis and the like. And when you see the interactions between the traders and the submitters, you see the submitters showing clear deference to the traders referring to them as sir or big boy, you know, always happy to help you, help you with it. Leave it to me, sir. And that's kind of an indication of an intra-organizational implicit st uh, status hierarchy. If you're interested in reading a bit more about that, actually a case writer at uh, Stanford and I recently wrote a case about the Barclays scandal. There's an HBS one as well, um, and, and theirs is quite good too. So, you know, you could get either of those and, you know, but it's, it, it's such an interesting thing. The irony of this, though, actually, is that what's going on in a lot of other banks, there was a lot of other badness happening, but Barclays will be forever known as the bank that this is most fundamentally associated with because they were the ones where the scandal broke first. So I think the big implication of this is actually really troubling. So I think most of us have done some stuff over the course of our lives that we would say is unethical. Maybe only small things, you know, maybe things that are modern. But we haven't, I, I'm guessing any of us, done anything that's as bad as the Health South scandal or as bad as what was going on with the LIBOR manipulation. But the troubling thing we should wonder about is, well, maybe I, I haven't done those things because I'm a good person. You know, that's a natural interpretation to have. But maybe I haven't done those things because I haven't been in a situation where I had the opportunity and the pressures on me from those around me to do it. And maybe I should be worried that if I were put in the right situation, I would do things that were clearly out of step uh, with my own deeply held ethical principles. So that's a pretty depressing and, and frightening conclusion, you know, in some sense. But I want to turn this around, actually, and take it in a much more positive direction. Because the things that I've been talking about, social influence and authority, 
are not just negative things about sort of bad conformity and obedience to people who are asking us to do bad things. They're also crucial components of teamwork and of leadership. I mean, authority is necessary for some types of leadership to happen. So we should think about the positive. If we're thinking about values-driven leadership, we should think about the positive side of this as well. And examples of this abound. So one example is this picture. It's actually a nice picture on the day after Veterans Day, in fact. This is the first wave of US soldiers going ashore at Omaha Beach in D-Day. These are combat engineers or sappers. Their job is to go and clear the way so the other troops can come through and you know, help liberate Europe from the Nazi occupation. This is an incredibly self-sacrificing thing to do. Huge numbers of these men died doing something that was wonderfully, in some sense, generous and positive for other people. I actually found out recently, I hadn't known this until a year ago, one of my next door neighbors was one of these guys. There's a set of 11 pictures that I found out this 95-year-old gentleman who lives in our condo complex, like right across the courtyard from me and my wife and daughter, um, was one of these one of the combat engineers here. And what's interesting to me is he's a totally normal guy. I mean, I, I ran into him yesterday. He was going to get his mail. You know, it, you don't. See, I don't see him as like being some heroic figure when I interact with him. And I don't think he sees himself as being a heroic figure either. He was just a normal person who was put in a situation where a normal person would respond to the normal social incentives for soldiers in a military unit to have a cohesive bond with the people that they're in the unit with and say, I'm in this with my buddies, we're doing this together, and we're following the legitimate authority of our commanding officer who's saying, go, 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 and who, by the way, is probably himself going to die too in this invasion. So that's social influence and authority being used for very good purposes. This actually played also a major role in the United States Civil Rights Movement as well. So this is a picture of uh, four young men who started a lunch counter sit-in at a Woolworths in Greensboro, North Carolina. So this is at a time when lunch counters are segregated and when people got killed for doing things like this. So this is a risky thing to do. They were really scared as they did this. They didn't just sort of up and decide to do this. They had deep connections to each other, strong social influence on each other. Some of them had gone hot to high school together. Others of them were, some of them had overlapping relationships as college roommates. That's what helped them stick with this when they were doing something that was very brave. And in fact, throughout, there's a classic study of the uh, civil rights movement by a sociologist that found that people who participated in the civil rights movement, what really explained them sticking with it was not sort of their ability to lucidly articulate the importance of their goals, but rather just whether they had friends who were doing it with them. That was the social influence factor played a, a major role in keeping things going when things were hard. Another example comes from religious and community organizations. So I, I actually happen not to be a religious person, but I'm constantly struck when I see in a lot of different religious groups the sense of conforming to expectations of peers and authority figures for appropriate and good relationships, the right way to interact with people within the religious community and the right way to rela relate to people who are outside of the religious community. A lot of religious communities use social influence and authority for very, very positive purposes. This also matters in sort of business settings. So there's this plant actually across the bay from where I live. Now it's a Tesla factory. Uh, but it has a very interesting history before becoming a Tesla factory. So this was, it used to be a GM, GM auto plant. And it was a horrible plant. The union leader from the plant at the time, after the fact, when interviewed about this, said, we were the worst workforce in the entire US auto industry. That's saying something if the union leader is saying that about, that about you know, the folks that you know, he was working with. So this is a place where there's like drug dealing, prostitution, people drunk on the job, people um, intentionally sabotaging cars to make it so the car would come out with a defect. Pretty unethical behavior in a lot of different ways. And what's interesting is this plant was closed and reopened as a GM Toyota joint venture. And the really interesting thing is they didn't hire a completely new workforce. They rehired 90% of the same people. They took the same people and they improved the organization to give better relationships between the workers and the authority figures and between the workers and their sense of their responsibility 
is working together with a team, as a team to try to match the high standards that Toyota was known for. And they succeeded. They immediately produced really high quality cars. So it's striking that it's not that they took bad people and made them good people. They took regular people in a badly functioning organization and made them better people by affecting the organizational context around them. So the question then, oh, actually, sorry, I got lost about where I was going. Um, there's a more general point here. It's not just about this GM Toyota joint venture. Anytime a company is doing something good, producing positive products for the world, it has a good corporate culture. Implicitly, what's going on within that company is they actually are using social influence and authority for really good and positive ends. So then the important question is to say, well, given that these social pressures and social influences and authority relationships can have really bad effects or really good effects, how do we try to get them to have the good rather than the bad effect? And I think that's the challenge for people as organizational leaders, which you guys will be over the course of your careers and your lives. And part of the answer on this has to do with incentives, setting up the right incentive systems. I'm enough of an economist that I'm always still going to believe in incentives. Um, there was a, a scandal that broke a few years ago with some companies in the United States that were shorting their employees on overtime pay. Now, it's a legitimate thing for a company to want not to pay overtime. You know, overtime is expensive. So they were incentivizing their managers and paying them bonuses based on not paying overtime. But these companies also at the same time had payroll systems that were almost impossible for employees to understand. So an employee wouldn't know whether she was getting paid for the hours she worked or not getting paid for the hours that she worked. And lo and behold, when you had managers at branches all around the company, around the country, who had incentives not to pay overtime and they could cheat their employees, guess what? A lot of them did cheat their employees in terms of paying overtime. In my view, the responsibility for that lies both on the managers and on the higher level executives within the companies who designed those incentive systems and payroll systems, when there were actually other payroll systems that would have solved the problem. So actually what McDonald's was doing at the time was that they would give employees a printout that says, here's the hours you work this day. You can't cheat someone who's getting a printout of the hours they work each day. You're not going to be able to do that. They could therefore still give managers that useful, from the company's perspective, incentive not to pay overtime while making sure that the managers didn't have an incentive to do something unethical. But this is also a question of roles. It's not just a question of incentives. It's also a question of sort of the, the formal and informal organizational structure of a group. And one of the most important roles to have is the role of disagreeing with the group. Actually, in the Milgram experiment, when someone objected, if there was another person in the room who said, no, we can't do this, then the person in the experimental subject condition, the person like me, generally wouldn't continue shocking. So having someone stand up and say, no, this is wrong, induce someone else to take a stand on that. So it's important to have legitimized dissent within organizations when there are very high stakes decisions being made. This is what President Kennedy did actually during the Cuban Missile Crisis. He tried to structure things so that there were sort of devil's advocates to argue against the position that the group was starting to take. And some of the time when we see disasters strike, so actually as seems to have been the case possibly, in a mining disaster in West Virginia a few years ago, it seems that maybe part of the issue was that dissent was squelched and people did not feel that they could come forward and point out problems that were going on. I say seems to be the case because this is an ongoing contentious issue, what exactly was going on um, with the uh, mine disaster in West Virginia. And the final thing that I want to note, so I know we're on a fairly tight time budget, and I think this will keep us on time, um, is actually implications not at the organizational but at the individual level. And I think what the, the social psychologists have shown pretty compellingly is that we really underestimate the power that pressures around us have on us. We tend to think of ourselves as our own individual person more than we really are. That has a variety of very important implications for us as individuals. We, we all encounter situations where we're uncomfortable about something, where we're being asked to do something that might be wrong. And in such circumstances, it's really important to try to take a step back and say, hold on, what are the pressures on me in this situation? And how can I deal with them effectively? And not to just do this in the moment, but to do this in advance. 
to say, if I'm going to go into a career in a particular industry, in a particular country, given the business I'm going to be in, what are the pressures I'm going to face? I know this is going to happen. I know someone is going to hit, up, hit me up for a bribe. I know someone is going to ask me to do something you know, as part of recruiting a client or something like that that is out of step with my own deep moral convictions. What's my plan? I need an actionable plan ready in my mind, sort of a playbook, for when those situations actually arise. And anticipating that if I as an individual do that, then others may join in as well. That's what's shown in both the Ash experiment and the Milgram experiment. And the final point that I want to make, actually at an individual level as well, is that it's important to think about choices of where to be and who to interact with as really shaping who we are. And if you take seriously the notion that context around us has a powerful effect, then it's really important to say, if I'm going to go into this context, it's really hard to expect that that context is not going to shape me in some very foundational way. I mean, it might not make me as bad as the worst people who are in that context, but I should expect that it'll have a profound effect on me. And therefore, to be careful about choosing the path of our lives so that we put ourselves in situations that will help us be the good and virtuous people that we aspire to be, rather than the not so good and not so virtuous people that we maybe all are capable of being. Uh, so that's what I wanted to say. I guess we have a few minutes to take questions if people have questions. Let me, let me first of all, just uh, uh, thank you, Ken, for this great presentation. Thank you. <laughs> now, <clears throat> may I ask the first question? <laughs> it's going to be hard. No. no, no. It's, <laughs> it's, it's yeah. not going to be hard. You know, we, we had the fascinating case of the, uh, the shuttle disaster. And, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and we yeah. live actually right in the zone of the people who were working yeah. on the, the shuttle case. And I, I think you probably have looked at that case a little bit. Is that right? I know the gist of the case. Just it's right. set up, it's like the racing case. So it's set up to parallel the shuttle disaster, okay. but yeah. and then to sucker people into launching, yeah. if I remember here, correctly. Here, here's a case yes. that's sort of a little bit like the, the Milgram experience in the sense that the, the, the guy with the white coat yeah. who was telling the subject to continue to push uh, the voltage. Those were the guys in Washington, D.C. Yeah. And they were continuing to tell the, the folks uh, who are actually out here uh, not too far from where yeah. we are right now making that, uh, that decision. Yeah. So uh, you know, here you have a case of people who were wanting to do the, the right yeah. thing, being pushed hard uh, in the direction of, of not doing the right thing. And it, it kind of goes to this point about scenario planning and how do you, yeah. you know, how can you imagine yourself into that? I mean, how does somebody who's like, you know, our students here sitting in class today, how do they think themselves into mm -hmm. a scenario like that so that they know what yeah. to do in advance? And, and that's my last question, and we'll let you get the questions for the group. That's a hard one. I, I said you were going to ask a hard question. You, you did ask a really hard question because ultimately the subtext of that question is what is the craft? And I think it is a craft. It's not just an immediate answer one can give, but what is the craft of being an ethical person and living in line with one's values? And to me, the answer on that is, in part, has to do with trying to tie. And I'm not sure about this answer. I should say, this is not my area of research expertise. You want to ask me about like game theoretic models of elections? You know, I can answer that one very confidently. But I, I think that the craft of doing this consists of finding ways to tie those scenarios into things that are very personal to either individuals that we care deeply about or to values that we hold deeply at the core of ourselves, to make it an issue that where we're going along with the thing that we disagree with is not just sort of an expedient thing, but it's in some sense a threat to our identity. So maybe, uh, just to follow up yeah. on it, so maybe it's a little bit like uh, Jeb Magruder in the Watergate scandal mm -hmm. said the reason why he felt like he got caught up in that is he didn't have a group of people back home yeah. that he had yeah. as a reference group yeah. who would be disappointed in him yeah. if he made that decision. So having a group of yeah. people that you th you sort of ask yourself, well, how would they feel about yeah. it if they knew that I did this? Another yeah. another example is, you know, how would I feel about it if it showed up on the front yeah. page of the New York Times? And I actually have a strong opinion about the difference between those two tests. Yeah. 
because I think that a lot of the time people, there's sort of the, the friends and family test. Mm -hmm. Do I feel like I need to, and, and this hits us in our gut, that's why I like it. Do I feel like I'm, you know, in my case, deceiving my wife or deceiving my closest friends? Or that when I look my six-year-old daughter in the eye, I'm not answering her completely honestly. You know, that, that to me is very intense and emotional. And that, that's, and as opposed to the, and I think that's good because also you can presume that those people share our values in some deep way. And I can imagine I can have the conversation with my wife, even though she and I don't agree on everything, but that she's willing to sit with me and I'm willing to sit with her if she's working through something and listen and understand the full depth and nuance of a decision. So that's why I really like the sort of friends and family test thing. I don't like the New York Times test as much. And yeah, the reason, why? yeah, the reason is I think it conflates strategy and ethics. So there's a strategic component of, oh man, if this gets in front of the New York Times, you know, and the, the world sees it, then this is going to hit us in some bad way. It's going to be embarrassing. It's going to be hard to explain. And so, so there's a strategy component to the motion. Like, I don't want to deal with that. Um, and this could be strategically bad. That's one reason I don't like the New York Times test. The other reason is that I think it's easier to discount. And the reason for that is if we don't fully respect, and most people have at least some parts of the media that they don't respect. So if you're, and it's particularly people within a company, they're often suspicious the media is out to get them. And if you think the media is out to get you, that makes it easy to discount the things that, oh, a journalist might get a hold of that. Well, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, they're just always out to get companies and things like that. So it doesn't hit us in the same way as the friends and family test, which is the one I like better. But yeah. Questions? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. positions are growing as far as almost whistleblowers per se? What do you mean by growing? As, as individuals yeah. that they're... As individuals in high-end companies, do you get more of them? Are, yeah. Are more okay, of them? okay. Are, there, are we getting more whistleblowers yeah. over time? Okay, I thought, I thought the question was, it's sort of a matter of cultivating virtue within oneself. Are they becoming... So to, re, to repeat the question so everyone can hear, and let me make sure I'm phrasing it correctly. Is the number of whistleblowers in bad situations increasing over time? Yes. Okay, I actually don't know the answer to that. I think that there are increased incentives to be a whistleblower because there are whistleblower statutes that do things like protect whistleblowers. Now, not fully all the time, but so the incentive systems are becoming better for promoting that. But I actually don't know the research. It's hard to know, actually. And there's a methodological reason, a statistical reason why it's hard to know. The right way to answer your question is to say, I know the rate of wrongdoing going on in the world. And then I can figure out what proportion of the wrongdoing that is going on is being reported. The problem is I don't know the rate of wrongdoing going on in the world. And I'm not willing to assume it's constant over time. If I'm willing to assume it's constant over time, then I could get at that question. But I don't think I can assume that. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure about that. That's the honest answer. Other questions? Um, yes, sir, over here. Yes, Dave. We're all above average, not just Americans. Um, so I've done this with a group of executives from a major Latin American company. When I do this with senior executives, it's 75% of the group is not from the US. Uh, so, and when I've done it with our mid-career executives, maybe 67% is not from the US. So it is not an American thing to think we're better than average. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay. But I think this presentation has clearly demonstrated, yes, we need to recognize that we're highly influenced by social context, but I'm wondering what the next step is. So if, for instance, 20 years from now, I'm elected to the House of Representatives, and I know that my choices and actions in the House of Representatives will determine my re-election, mm -hmm. possibly. 
what's going to prevent me from still just making choices to get reelected? So the answer on that is you should read the paper Leadership and Pandering, a Theory of Executive Policymaking, which is actually and I, I don't want to plug my own research. I didn't see the opportunity coming, but I will. Um, <laughs> which is that, so I think politicians often face a problem that they have. I'm a believer in the idea that politicians have access to expert information that ordinary voters don't. They know more than ordinary voters do about a lot of policy making things. Not everyone agrees with that assumption. If you start with that assumption, then in circumstances where a politician believes that voters misperceive their true interests, then the politician faces a choice. Do I pander to the public doing the thing that they currently think is in their interest, or do I exercise leadership by doing the thing that I think is in their interest? And I think that if they knew what I know, they would also agree was in their interest. Um, so the basic answer on this is incentives to lead versus pander are a function of the electoral cycle and how close of a race you face. Um, so if you're actually far ahead or far behind your opponent, you have incentives actually to act as a leader. So actually a great story of this is Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War um, at a time when there's a lot of people in the North who are saying the war's been going on for a while. It doesn't look like it's ending anytime soon. They keep replacing the chief generals and stuff like that. It's all a mess. Um, and there's a lot of people in the North who say, you know, let's just give up this, this fight. Let's just get the Union back together. We'll continue. We'll have peace with slavery. And Lincoln thinks he's way behind going into the election of 1864. And he actually sort of thinks, you know, that it's the right thing to continue the war to end slavery, but also someone in his shoes has an electoral incentive to try to do that because the only way he could win, actually this is, you know, right before the Union Army goes on a tear through Georgia and the like, um, that that is, that's the only way he could win was by trying to do the right thing. It's when the race is close and the election is soon that pandering incentives are the greatest. Um, and I think at that point, really that comes down to, again, that's just a question that if you wind up being in the House of Representatives someday, first of all, congratulations. Um, and second of all, though, I think it's useful to think about before you're in that position to anticipate this will come up. As I said before, how am I going to deal? This is a likely scenario. And to start thinking now, those of you who are considering a career in politics potentially, start thinking now, how do I cultivate my own virtues within myself in line with my values so I'll do the right thing when that time comes? That's the best answer I can give. That's a great answer. And I just want to editorialize on the answer. Uh, I would encourage you all to read uh, John Huntsman's new book, uh, Billionaire, uh, Barefoot to Billionaire, because he talks about a scenario in which he was in the Nixon White House. Uh, and being heavily pr uh, pushed by the then chief of staff, H.R. Haldeman, uh, to do something that violated his own personal uh, uh, sense of right and wrong. He didn't really know that it was right and wrong, what he was being asked to do uh, initially. It just didn't feel quite right. And he's in the middle of the process. It's, it's, what it was, what the, the scenario is he's been asked to put an undercover spy <laughs> in a factory to fight to get dirt on, on a political opponent. And he's in the process, literally in the middle of the phone call, when, he, uh, when his moral compass kicks in. And he tells his, his uh, plant manager, forget I ever called, and he goes back and tells the second most powerful person in the United States, I'm not going to do this. At the time, I think he was 33 years old. Uh, and he knew that it was a career-limiting move. He knew that he was basically taking himself out of the White House when he did it. And oh, by the way, what a great thing he did, because this was February in 1972 that he actually left the White House. The break-in, the Watergate break-in that you all know from history was in the summer of 1972. And virtually everybody else that worked on Haldeman's staff went to jail or had their reputations completely destroyed. I believe that John Huntsman would not have become John Huntsman had he not kicked into that very thing that you're talking about, that sort of moral compass. And I think the other thing that one should worry about is even someone who generally has a strong moral compass, if they do that one step, then the Watergate break-in right. is a smaller next step slippery to do, slope. and it'd be harder to stay. And I don't think we go down every bad slippery slope we can find, but. 
some of them people do go down. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you so much. Um, a little memento. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much. Great.